This is a follow-up video to one I posted recently on this AMA 714B Mini Lathe. And I posted the first video because I was quite impressed with the apparent quality of this machine. Uh, I bought it uh, for just over £900 delivered and I've been testing it. And so far it's, it has impressed me, even out of the box it seemed fairly good, which is why I posted the original video. And so I've been asked to show it um, machining uh, a few more materials. So in this video we'll do a very quick um, test of it uh, machining uh, various things from plastic through to titanium. And uh, we'll try steel, tool steel, silver steel, as I say titanium, aluminium, brass, and um, see how well it does. Um, before we get on to that, just a few points I want to go over um, based on some comments I received on the first video. Uh, one was a very interesting comment about um, getting started on a lathe like this was um, a, a safe option because it's you can't really injure yourself on something like this, uh, or at least not too badly, uh, which is true and it's a, an extremely good point. Um, but I, I've never been able to decide if starting on a small safe machine is better than starting on a big dangerous machine. So for example take something as simple as, um, incidentally you can see I fitted the chuck guard, uh, something like the chuck key. Now when you buy this machine um, this comes with a, a spring on the chuck key and the idea is that if you p let go of the uh, key with it uh, in the chuck it will pop out so you can't leave it in there. So you're kind of getting used to relying on not having to remember to take this out of the chuck. Now this won't be present on a larger machine and so if you're relying on not having to remember to take the chuck key out on a small lathe it can hurt you if you start this uh, with the chuck key in. On a big lathe it can kill you. So I've got a general rule when I'm using machine tools like this whether it's a small one or a big one and that when I'm using a chuck key I never let go of it or, or leave it in the chuck. I always take it out. Even if I'm going to immediately put something back in the chuck, I will always take the chuck key out. And that way I'm guaranteed I never leave it in the chuck. I never put it in, for example, go away to get the thing I want to put in the chuck because uh, you might get distracted and then uh, end up not realizing it's in there. Okay, so that's the first thing is don't get into bad habits just because it's a small and relatively safe machine because you don't want to then move on to a big machine and take those bad habits with you. Having said that, they're a fantastic machine to learn on. Uh, they're relatively cheap, relatively safe, as long as, as I say, you don't develop bad habits. While we're on the subject of safety, I see an awful lot of, um, if you go on eBay, if you look for a, a lathe work light, uh, most that are sold these days are LED lights and you do need to be really careful using an LED light on a lathe. You can see I fitted a light to this um, lathe now. It's all, I always prefer to have lights on machine tools. It makes them so much nicer to use. But I always use um, halide lamps, tungsten halide lamps. I never use LED lights. And the reason for that is most LED lights flicker. Now you can stop them flickering. You can put capacitors in the power supply, for example. But if they flicker, in the UK here, an LED light will flicker at 100 hertz. And so any multiple of that will appear to make the chuck stationary. So if you run the chuck at 1000 RPM, it will appear to not be rotating because of the strobe effect of the LED light. So just be aware of that. If you do use LED lights, they're very good, very efficient, very bright. Um, but just bear in mind, if you're using them with a rotating machine, uh, you're best to get one that does not flicker, uh, otherwise you could, um, although you, you know, the machine makes a noise, it's still easy to get distracted and you, it appears to be stationary, so you put your hand in and the next thing you know there's uh, fingers and, and uh, toes everywhere, so just be aware of that. Uh, so that uh, aside, these machines are fun to use. Now one other comment I got was, um, the world these days seems to be uh, full of experts and I'm not really sure what that word means anymore. Um, even if you have an expert that has very limited knowledge they still seem to think that just because they haven't seen something it doesn't exist and experts these days seem to have a very limited uh, field of knowledge. 
and that's really why I started making these videos and I've said many times don't do things the way I do them it's not necessarily the right way um, I'm just doing this to try and encourage people to get into the, this sort of thing um, experiment try your own way of doing things just because I haven't said you can do it a certain way doesn't mean you can't do it a certain way you can do it however you want uh, but some people seem to think because they haven't seen something that that something doesn't exist and a good example of that was in two comments I had on the previous video now I pointed out there was a bug in the DRO I didn't really go into any detail because it's not what the video was about the video was about my impression of the lathe and the DRO but as a sort of general uh, at a general level it wasn't really a detailed uh, blow by blow analysis of the machine so I didn't go into any detail and but what I'd said was that the uh, if you set it as a lathe then it's not consistent in the way it identifies the axis and the y axis is wrong uh, but if you set it as a mill then it works and that's all I said now somebody came back and said no you're completely wrong um, the uh, two axes on a lathe are always x and z and that's wrong uh, it's also right normally in industrial DROs the uh, x-axis is x and the longitudinal axis is uh, z0 and then you'll have z1 etc um, but that's only normally if you have uh, DROs with more than two channels if you have just a two channel DRO then normally they are um, identified as x and y and I have a number of machines that have uh, exactly that two channel DROs where the two axes are identified as x and y so I was saying what I actually had what was in front of me what I've used for decades but I still then had somebody come back and say no it's always x and z so are you sure I took this photograph this morning it's one of my machines and they're all similar to this some are different manufacturers but they look very similar to this and if you look you can see they're identified as X and Y not X and Z so my comment that the machines I have use X and Y I stand by that's what you may see so the advice I'm trying to give in these videos is what you may see uh, how to deal with it and uh, it's not very helpful to have somebody coming along saying that something that you personally have seen doesn't exist it's, it's kind of silly um, so you may see the X and the Y identified as X and Y or as X and Z however having said that that's not what my comment was about I'll move the camera so we can see the DRO and I'll explain in a bit more detail what the bug was I was trying to describe okay hopefully the camera's picking up the DRO display okay and uh, as you can see I've got this set so that it's displaying the two axes as X and Y and um, it's up to you you can set this up however you want but if I go into the configuration and we look at the general configuration for this you'll see I've got it set as a mill but when I come in here and we look at everything that requires you to access the two axes then you'll see they're identified as X and Y so it's consistent throughout and it does that on all the screens uh, whichever screen you go to it will correctly identify uh, the axes as X and Y or it also has U on here um, but we don't use that it's just X and Y um, so you can see it's consistent and that's what's on the main display X and Y so you can obviously tie up the X and Y correctly that's fine however the point I was trying to make was that there is a bug in or I believe it's a bug in this system if you set this to lathe okay we'll go back out we now have what would be a more traditional multi-axis DRO display so we have X is the X and the Z naught is the longitudinal axis however the bug I was talking about is if we then go into the configuration notice they're identified as X and Y and that's again consistent throughout the menu or it's, well, it's fairly inconsistent but it's in several of the menus so if we go back to uh, various uh, different screens that are identified as X and Y even though on the main display they're X and Z naught 
And that's the bug I was talking about. So it's an inconsistency. If you're not used to DROs and lathes, then it might be confusing as to which particular parameter it is you're setting up. So the point I was making was that you can stop it doing that by setting it to mil. And then once you do that, it's X and Y on the main display, and that then matches the X and Y in the menus. So hopefully that now makes sense. That's the bug I was talking about. It's up to you whether you go with the traditional X and Z or X and Y. It makes no real difference as far as the machine operation is concerned. Um, but if you're going to contradict and argue, then at least try to understand the point that's being made. Otherwise, it's just a pointless uh, argumentative comment. OK, so we'll go back, look at the lathe. I'll show the changes I've made to this so far, and then we'll try machining a few different materials. OK, so looking back at the lathe, hopefully you can see this. Again, apologies for the lighting in here. It's not my usual uh, area for filming, but um, I'm hoping you can see what I'm doing. Now, the first change I made was to realign the speed display. So that's now correctly showing in the center of the uh, window before I couldn't see the um, bottom segments on the N2 digit. So that's now square and centered in the window. Uh, I've also, as you can see, fitted the chuck guard. I've modified the um, tail stock so that the clamp works in the direction that I wanted it to. Previously locked when you moved it to the right, but I prefer it to lock when you move it to the left. So I've modified this. So now in the uh, right position, it's loose. And when you move it across to the left, it locks. So that means I can just move my hand back, release it and slide it back all in one action. I don't have to kind of move it one way and then move the tailstock in the other direction. Uh, so it's um, that's like all the rest of my machines and I prefer it that way. It's up to you, personal choice, but um, it was a fairly easy modification. So I went ahead and uh, did that. Um, I've also been correcting the uh, compensation. Uh, when I did a, a quick calculation, I, I showed um, how I normally go about doing this in the previous video. So I cut a piece to a certain size, set the DRO to match, wound the um, cross feed in, cut the part again, remeasured, and then that will give me the error between what the DRO was showing and what the machine was doing. I tend to prefer to do it un when under load when it's cutting rather than using a, uh, a gauge or micrometer or dial gauge simply because these do flex and um, if you just try and use a no load static uh, test then the error might uh, still be there or it'll be smaller. Um, but what I found is that the error was about 10 millimeters per meter which is, is specified as millimeters per meter in the menu so in the, when you look at the DRO um, it shows you the uh, error in terms of um, the error per meter. Uh, and it was about 10 millimetres. Now, the maximum correction that you can put into the DRO is 1.9 millimetres, plus or minus. So I wasn't going to be able to correct it. And looking around, what I found was that these sensors had not been uh, screwed in square, so they were screwed in, off uh, screwed in offset at an angle. And that meant that they weren't parallel. The sensor and the, uh, basically the, the index plate weren't uh, parallel, so uh, it was giving an error. So the first thing I did was I squared them up to make them as parallel as I could, and the error was then down to uh, very close to zero. Um, I still haven't got it exactly dialed in yet, but it's it's now better than 0.5 millimeters per meter, and on such a small travel that gives you quite a nice precise um, uh, uh, accuracy. And in fact, it's getting within the resolution of the DRO. The other important thing in the testing I've been doing is to machine a part to a certain size. Um, set the size on the DRO, move the uh, axis away, so one and back and forth a few times, go back, set exactly the same um, X size, try and remachine it and see if the part changes size. It shouldn't do, of course, if it's gone back to the same position. And it didn't, uh, and then wind it in maybe uh, five hundredths of a millimeter and see if it changes the part size by that amount. What I'm looking for is repeatability. And, and that was fine as well. It, uh, it's repeating within better than a hundredth of a millimeter, which is very good. Um, so uh, I've also added a work light, as you can see. And I say it's always good to have a work light on the lathe and uh, makes life much easier, much more pleasant to use.
Um, made a few other minor changes, mostly um, in terms of really giving it a service. People buy these, say they work for a while, then it stops working. Um, like any mechanical device, these do need maintenance, and it's best to give them a service before you start to use them in anger. And uh, what I found on this one was that neither end of the lead screw had been lubricated, so there's a, uh, a ball lubricator on the right and just uh, an open port on the left, but they were both uh, completely dry. So um, I lubricated the entire machine and um, it did uh, quiet down quite a bit. And uh, I have, of course, lubricated the lead screw gearbox, the whole thing. I've cleaned and lubricated the ways a few times. I cleaned out the Gibbs a few times. They're fine. They haven't loosened off to any uh, appreciable degree. They have loosened very slightly and they will loosen over the first few months of use. Uh, we'll then readjust them but so far there's still no slack in this and we'll uh, get some idea as to how good it is once we try machining something. So that's what we'll move on to now. We'll try machining a few materials. Uh, so we'll start and we'll go through something from plastic and we'll end up going through steel, tool steel, silver steel and we'll end up trying to machine a big chunk of titanium. This is solid titanium so we'll try machining this. Now at the moment I don't have many tools for a lathe this size. Mine, all my tools are much too big. I can only find one that would fit this. It takes 10 millimeter tools. Um, or you can put 8mm in and, and pack them. Um, I've got some on order and I'll grind a few as well. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, but for now what I've got is a single 10mm tool with a, um, a carbide insert and that's what we'll use for all the testing. Uh, so we'll get on with this. We'll start off with the plastic and then work our way through uh, into tougher materials and uh, see how good a job uh, this small lathe can do. So we'll work our way through each of the materials we're going to try and what I'm going to do this is not a full review, it's not an in-depth uh, tutorial on how to use a lathe, this is just to see how well this lathe um, with a fairly uh, cheap uh, carbide tool can cut various materials. So what I'm going to do is um, do a single pass, we'll take off about 0.1 millimeters uh, off all the materials, we'll then measure the size of the uh, part and we'll do a second pass without moving the cross feed in and uh, see how much more material it takes off. That's really to see um, how much it's deflecting while it's trying to cut. It'll give us a good idea as to um, how rigid this machine is and its uh, potential for uh, accuracy. Okay so we'll start and the first uh, material we'll use is some Delrin rod. This is just a hard plastic and uh, you can see this is a long piece but this is where we have um, an advantage with having a decent sized bore in the headstock. You can just pass this all the way through the machine. So I'll get this mounted in the chuck. I'll actually zoom you in a little bit so you can see it cutting more accurately and uh, we'll run the speed. Uh, I'll vary the speed depending on the material but uh, it will be something uh, reasonable speed for the uh, material. Bear in mind uh, this is only a, a 550 watt machine, it's only got a, a three-quarter horsepower motor so uh, we do need to bear that in mind uh, when we're sort of setting up the depth of cut and uh, feed speeds. Okay, so I'll get this set up and uh, we'll prepare ourselves to make the first pass. I've got the material mounted in the chuck and what we'll do is um, I'll wind the cross feed in, I'll start the machine up, wind the cross feed in, touch off so we're just touching the surface of the material uh, and then we'll uh, wind the cross feed in a further 0.1 millimeters, do a, a single pass, measure the part, do a second pass and uh, see how well it uh, performs. Now for long pieces you would of course use a, a center in the tail stock but we're just doing a short um, cut here. I haven't lined up the tail stock yet so it probably cut a taper anyway so um, this is just really to see how well it cuts short parts. Okay, so we're just uh, touching the surface of the material. I'll wind the, um, the cross feed in a further 0.1 millimeters and uh, we'll now do a single pass. I'm going to use the 
um, power feed so I'll run it in about 10 or 15 millimeters and um, we'll then measure the part. Okay, so it's made the first pass. Um, this is not an ideal tool for all these materials, by the way. It's just the, the one I happen to have lying around. So what we'll do now is measure the part. I'm going to back the tool away, um, measure the part, and then move it back into the same um, indicated position. And we'll then see our second pass if it takes any more material off. So what I've done, I've zeroed the x-axis on the DRO so I can return to the same location. We'll measure this. And we're getting 10.64 millimeters. So I'll wind the cross feed back so it's reading zero again. So we're heading, we're going in the same direction we were when I fed it in the first time. So there's no backlash. Okay, so that's now reading zero. We'll make a second pass. And we'll measure it again. Okay, so it's taken off a couple of hundredths of a millimeter, so not too bad. Most of that will be actual flex in the plastic itself, so um, quite a nice surface finish. It's nice and smooth. Okay, so seems to handle plastic fine. What I'm going to do now, just as a final test, is wind it in a full millimeter and see how it handles that. Okay, we'll see if it can manage that. Okay, and it managed that just fine. So again, still a good surface finish. Okay, I'll move the camera back slightly. It was uh, a bit of vibration shaking the camera. Oh, that didn't make you feel too ill. Um, but it managed to cut that just fine. Nice surface finish. So it handles plastic without any problems. Uh, or at least um, it seems to with this type of plastic. So we'll now move on. We'll go to a piece of brass. We've already tried brass, but just to be consistent, we'll run a piece of brass through. Okay, so we've got the brass in place. We'll do exactly the same thing with this. I'm just going to touch off and then we'll wind in 0.1 millimeters. And we'll try cutting. Okay, I'm zero the DRO. We'll measure the part. 18.2. We'll set the DRO so it's reading zero again. Hope you can see the uh, sun is shining through the window, so I hope it's not blinding the camera. Okay, so it was 18.2, we'll see what it now is. So 18.21, so it hasn't really grown, it's just this is just the tolerance of uh, measurements. It did take a very small amount of material off, I could see it taking something off, but obviously it's um, very small amount. So 
In other words, uh, it's looking fairly good. It's not deflecting too much. Um, second passes will nearly always take material off, especially with a fairly uh, pointed uh, tool. So that's not that surprising, but we're not drastically changing the dimensions of the part, which is the most important thing. So the next thing we'll do is we'll try a piece of aluminium. I've got a piece of aluminium mounted. I've got the um, depth of cut set to 0.1 millimeters. So we'll try making the cut. So 25.28. Uh, incidentally, if you get, uh, if you're doing a very shallow cut like this and you're getting all sorts of marking and pitting and scoring, it may well be that the bearings need replacing some of these um, cheap machines. I don't know where the bearings come from, but uh, quite often, even from new, the bearings are very poor. So keep an eye on that. These look fine, but um, we'll have to see how they last. Uh, so back to the start position. Got it set back to where it did the previous cut and we'll try a second pass. We can see it's taken a very, very light skin. Twenty five point two seven. So it's taken about a hundredth of a millimetre off on the second pass which is not that unusual. Usually if you do a spring pass and the second pass um, is going to take a little bit off, but hopefully you can see the quality of the machining um, from this uh, very cheap lathe is extremely good. It's almost like a mirror finish on there. So that's um, that is quite nice. It's quite a good finish. So I'm quite impressed so far. The next thing we're going to do is a piece of 01 tool steel so I'll get this set up okay I've got the machine set to its starting position 0.1 millimeter depth of cut it's 01 tool steel obviously it's in its non-hardened state so we'll try cutting that and see how well it does at 9.97 millimeters. Now this is of course a much tougher material for the lathe so I'm expecting to see more deflection on this. Yes. Okay so it was touching but um, only barely so Okay, so it's taken a couple of hundredths uh, off, which is not that surprising. And again, this is something you will tend to find if you do multiple passes, this nearly always happens, but it shouldn't take off more than a few hundredths. If it takes off more than that, then either the part is bending or the machine is flexing. So um, it's again, looking quite good. And again, the surface finish is good. It's not quite as good as it was because we were kind of rubbing the surface there rather than cutting. So um, not that uh, good a way of doing it. What I'm going to do now is increase the depth of cut to about 0.5 millimeters and see if it can manage that. Now, again, it's only a um, 500 watt uh, machine, so uh, we'll see if it struggles. And uh, again, I'm not using coolant here. In fact, I don't think this machine would be safe to use coolant on. Um, you can kind of see the motor through uh, various holes in this and the electronics is not really waterproof. so. I think using coolant on this might be quite dangerous. There's no drain port in the tray anyway, so um, a bit of um, you could use a paintbrush and a bit of oil, something like that, um, if you need to. But uh, it's not a particularly powerful machine, so uh, flooded uh, coolant probably isn't necessary. Okay, I'll wind this in. So we've got about half a millimetre, and we'll see if it can manage that. Okay. 
Okay, well that's quite impressive. It's managed to cut this fairly well. I just want to check to see if there's any appreciable taper on what it's cut. That's 9.01 millimetres. And 8.97. So it is cutting a taper. It's not that surprising. I suspect the machine is flexing and uh, that will be worse the further out the part is sticking plus the part itself will be flexing um, but it is cutting it um, quite nicely so you just finish off the part with some light passes but that's uh, quite impressive that it can cut fairly deep um, depth of cut on a piece of tool steel so we'll move on and the next thing we'll try is a piece of uh, mild steel and see how it manages with this Okay, well I am impressed. The, the quality of the surface finish on this is much better than I was expecting. It's very consistent, very even. Um, with all the small layers I've used in the past, I would get uh, uneven surface finish. And uh, this is looking very good. It, I can't feel any roughness on it. I can't feel any irregularities. So, looking quite promising. And uh, the last thing I want to try and cut um, today is um, a piece of uh, titanium. Now one of the advantages before we do that, so one of the advantages uh, of a small lathe is, um, I've probably mentioned in the past I make uh, clocks, and uh, if you try to cut a, uh, an arbor for a clock, and if it's a very small one like this, a pivot, um, you might want to cut something that's only a millimetre, and tr trying to do this in a huge lathe uh, well, you can do it, and it's not a big issue. Uh, it's not ideal, but in a small lathe like this, I'll just pop this out. In the big lathe, you need to use a collet holder or something similar. Um, but with this, uh, you could, of course, just put the part directly into the uh, chuck. Now, you can't turn this. You can see I've turned the end on this, um, uh, but you can't turn this with a tool like this. Normally, what you have to do is grind uh, your own tools. So this is uh, one of the tools I'd use for something like this. It's made out of uh, high-speed steel. Um, but uh, an advantage with a small lathe like this, this of course won't fit in here, um, but what you can do is use smaller blanks, uh, which means it's far easier to actually make the tool, uh, simply because you kind of, um, you only got a quarter of the material to remove, so it's a lot easier. Uh, and then of course you've got uh, far more visibility, you can get closer to the part than you can with a big lathe, you don't want to be sticking your head too close to a, uh, a 10 inch chuck while you're doing this, but a small lathe like this, especially as you can run it faster, is uh, far more suitable, so another advantage with a small lathe like this. Okay, now what I'm going to have to do for our piece of titanium is swap the chuck jaws, they do come with internal and external chuck jaws, um, but this is too big to go into the internal ones, so I need to swap it for the alternate set of jaws. So let's get that done. I've swapped the chuck jaws. Um, normally the part that sticks out this far, you should really centre drill it and put a centre in it. Um, but I'm just going to leave it like this. It's a very shallow cut. It is titanium, so it uh, can be quite tough to uh, machine. Um, but I want to see if this uh, machine can actually handle something of this diameter that's fairly tough to cut. Um, if you do machine titanium, just be fairly cautious with it. it. It has got a habit of catching fire, so the swarf can easily catch fire. And um, the only reason I have machined much titanium is um, the JM website was originally set up to um, provide uh, model jet engine parts. I made a lot of uh, titanium parts and uh, high precision shafts, that sort of thing. And so uh, I used to machine quite a lot of titanium and it is uh, quite interesting material to machine. But one of the biggest problems is if you get a lot of swarf under your lathe, it can catch fire and it's quite difficult to put it out. Um, I doubt this machine has got enough power to um, generate enough heat to set fire to it, but um, it's also something you need to be aware of if you're machining a material like this. 
Okay, this is a bit of an unfair test for this machine. I'm not quite sure if it's going to be able to manage it, but uh, let's give it a go and uh, see what happens. Okay, you can see that the part is more than uh, 0.1 out of round. However, it is cutting it extremely nicely, so very impressed. Uh, again, you probably can't see it that well because of the sun, so uh, sorry again for that. Um, this is an extremely nice finish. It's very nice and even. There's no pit, it's not digging in, and um, quite often if there's a lot of play in the lathe, you'll find that it'll run rub along the surface and dig in and gouge it and there's no gouging there's nothing at all what i'm going to do is actually go in another 0.1 millimeters and uh, try and run it again and see if it cleans up the cut but what's coming off here looks like properly cut material it's not rubbing it off it's actually cutting it which is uh, what you want to see so as i say we'll go in another 0.1 and uh, see how it does Okay, so again, it's cutting the material, it's not rubbing it off, it's not uh, doing anything weird. In fact, this is all, I think, one piece, so it's come off in a single cut. And the surface finish, again, is really nice. So I'll just take this out of the chuck and you can have a closer look. And this is, as I say, solid titanium. It's a mini lathe to be able to create a finish like that is extremely impressive. So. So far, I can't really fault it. It's um, definitely surpassed my expectations. And this is probably as much as you can ask of a small lathe like this, to be able to machine a big hunk of titanium like this and give such a nice surface finish. But not only that, but to actually be properly machining it. It's not um, gouging, digging, rubbing, that sort of thing. It's actually cutting it cleanly. So uh, fantastic. It's um, certainly surprised me and so far as i say i can't fault it this is a really nice machine